Good evening and welcome to uh, another Wednesday night as we have time to be able to come together to study. I'm super excited about the study that we're currently going through. Uh, I will go ahead and forewarn you, there's a lot of material to cover tonight, so I really don't want to rush through it. So we'll see how time permits. Uh, my goal initially when I started this was to be able to do uh, one full lesson each Wednesday. So we'll have to see uh, how time permits tonight with that as we're jumping in to the Beatitudes. We're going to be looking at the first four Beatitudes tonight. So if you'll turn in your Bibles, if you've not already, to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read just a few verses, verses 3 through 6. And then in your workbook, we'll be on page 21. Let me also point out, I mentioned this last week, but the work that you uh, did over the past week, the assigned reading, if you have questions about the answers, I'm not going to have time to go over those uh, during our normal sessions, but if you'll see me afterwards, I'll be happy to give you any of the answers to those questions if you're, uh, if you're in need of that. All right, so Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to uh, begin reading in verse 3. Verse 3, the Bible says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Let me point out just a couple of objectives as we begin tonight. Number one, uh, we're going to outline an interpretive approach to the Beatitudes. And then we're going to define and discuss the first four Beatitudes that are found here in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Uh, so in the first few lessons, what we did is we just gave you kind of a, a 30,000 foot overview of Matthew chapters 5 through 7. Beginning tonight, what we're going to do is we're going to start working verse by verse through these three chapters. So I'm looking forward to being able to do this. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, I've never done an in-depth study of the Beatitudes. So I'm excited and looking forward to the opportunity to move through this. So let me point out, uh, if you've got your workbook there, you can go ahead and look on page 21. This is pointed out under the initial observations. In his book, Studies in the Sermon on the Mount, the commentator Martin Lloyd-Jones offers five general observations to help understand or help people understand the Beatitudes. So that's my goal as we move through this is to give you a better understanding as to what these Beatitudes are. So if you want to go ahead and write in your outline there, number one, all Christians should be like this. So I've said this before, but these characteristics should be evident in the lives of believers. We should nurture these attitudes. And keep in mind, you and I cannot do this in and of ourselves. We can't. There's, there's no way possible we can do this. We need to be empowered by the Spirit. Uh, if you want to write down again, I know I mentioned this last week, but Galatians chapter 5, Paul speaks there very clearly of the fact that you've got to walk by the Spirit so that you do not obey the lust of the flesh. Look, as a Christian, that's something that you struggle with every day. You've got to uh, surrender to one or the other. So it, it, it's, it's a daily process. Nobody's perfected these Beatitudes, but we're seeking to live them out. We're seeking to become less like ourselves and more like Jesus. So this should be the aim for us as believers. We should reflect these characteristics. We should reflect the mind of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and it involves us doing work. I mean, it would be wonderful if we trusted Jesus and then all of a sudden after we trusted the Lord, uh, he grabbed one of these little uh, USB drives and just plugged it in. And man, we, we know everything about, ask me a verse about the Bible and I'll tell you, and we just know how to live all of that out, but it just doesn't work that way. We still live in a, a fallen, sin-sick, evil, wicked world. And you can turn the television on and see that. It's just terrific. So hopefully this will be an encouragement to us tonight. So all Christians should be like this. So don't adopt the mindset that, oh, well, you know, that really doesn't apply to me because it does. It applies to every single believer. 
no matter if you've been a Christian for a day or a month or a year or for 50 years, it applies to you and to me. All right, number two, all Christians should manifest all these characteristics. Every one of these attitudes is the responsibility of every single believer. Now, we know that some believers have different gifts and different talents. I would love to be able to sit down and play the piano like Miss Beebe did tonight. I'm glad she came in because I only know two songs, so we would have had to do one of those two songs. But uh, she's got different talents and different gifts than I have. And if we were to go around the room and look at each and every one here tonight, and even those that have joined us online, we'll be able to see that not all of us possess the same gifts and the same talents, the same skill sets, but all of the gifts that we have are to be used for one purpose, and that is to honor and to glorify God. So as Christians, we should seek to manifest all of these characteristics. Again, the key, and I made a, a note in my notes here, the Holy Spirit is the one who helps this. I wrote down, Holy Spirit, help me, help me. A couple other verses, if you want to write down that pertain to the, the Holy Spirit, uh, you can write down John chapter 16. That's where John explains the role of the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. Um, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit works in and through it, us to enable us to do this. So we need the Spirit to help us. Uh, we can all be peacemakers by the Spirit empowering us. We can all endure persecution with grace, not in and of ourselves, but with the Spirit helping us. And we can mourn over the things that grieve God. That's one of the things I want us to keep in mind as we look at this tonight. When we're talking about mourning, we're talking about mourning over those things that, that God mourns. Over. So we'll, we'll get into more of that as we move on. All right, number three. And if I get to going too fast, just raise your hand and say, hey, I, I, I've got a question and I'll be happy to slow down. All right, number three, none of these refer to natural tendencies. <laughs> the Bible says that nobody seeks after God. So, so naturally, in and of ourselves, uh, these are not the tendencies that we possess. Uh, we shouldn't confuse these attitudes with the responses we see in unbelievers. For instance, the morning of verse four isn't just plain old regular sadness. Or after looking at verse 9, we might know of a few people who resolve conflicts really well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the peacemaking heart attitude that you'll find in a mature believer. We should desire peace. I was listening to uh, Zelensky and his uh, 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 speech today to the, the Congress and the Senate, and the, the key word that stood out is peace. I mean, the world longs for peace. And as we go through these and look at these, uh, we're talking about peace. We should desire peace. Jesus uh, was, was uh, a man of peace. And we know that uh, peace comes through the Prince of Peace, who is Jesus. So again, these are not natural tendencies in and of ourselves. So the Beatitudes require the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we've hit that three times there in a row. All right, number four. These mark the essential differences between Christians and unbelievers. You've heard me say before uh, from the pulpit numerous times that as Christians, we should be able to stand beside a non-believer and somebody look at us and say, that person is different from that person by the way that we live our lives, by the way we conduct ourselves. But it's sad that that's not always the case. Many times today, you'll look at somebody that claims to be a Christian and somebody who, you know, denies Jesus, and you can't really see much difference there. But the Bible tells us that as believers, we're to be set apart. So uh, these mark the essential differences between Christians and unbelievers. Few passages of scripture draw a clearer line between the saved and the lost. Believers can model the Beatitudes if they rely on the Spirit. Again, these are not natural tendencies. Unbelievers, no matter how bad they want to do this, they can't do it. And neither can you and I in and of ourselves. All right? 
The author goes on to point out here, they might show mercy, but they cannot act out of a pure heart of mercy. They might be persecuted, but not for righteousness sake, because Christ hasn't made them righteous before God. If you want to write another scripture down, one that came to mind as I was uh, preparing is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's Jesus. You and I in and of ourselves are not righteous. We need the righteousness of Christ. And uh, the term, the theological term that's used for that is imputed righteousness. It's imputed to us. It's reckoned or given to us by God when we turn from our sins and we trust Jesus with our lives. So it's the essential difference between Christians and non-believers. All right, number five, Christians and unbelievers belong to two different realms. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Y'all have heard that before, right? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. So the scripture presents us as spirit regenerated sinners renewed from the very core of our being. As I pointed out last week, we are children of God. And I like to do this uh, anytime I reference something like that. I like to put a scripture down just to be able to remember that. John 1, 12, you can write down for that, children of God. Uh, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So it's only through Christ we're utterly and essentially different from the way we were before we trusted Jesus. Just think about that for a moment. Think about that in your own life. I mean, don't, don't say anything out loud, but just think about the ways that you're different now because you've trusted Jesus. The things that you do now or do not do because Jesus has come into your life. I think about the early years as a teenager, I had, I had a mouth right there with the sailors. You know what I mean? But, but when I trusted the Lord, the Lord took that away from me. I mean, I, I don't desire that anymore. So think about the ways that your life has changed and uh, the fact that, that, that you're not uh, of the world, but you're in the world. Okay? Okay, so now let's step into uh, the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. All right, the first is blessed are the poor in spirit, verse three. So what we're gonna do as we move through this, let me just highlight it. Uh, as we look at these verses, we'll review the basic meaning or the definition of the heart attitude, and then we'll discuss the implications and the promised blessing. So we'll do that for each of these as we walk through them. So number one, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, under number one there, uh, letter A, the definition, Humility, a complete absence of self-reliance. Uh, there's a couple words that, that come to mind, or one specific word that comes to mind when I think about humility, and it's the very opposite of that, pride. So when you think about humility, the opposite of that is going to be pride. So if you're prideful, then you're not going to be one who displays humility. Those things are like polar opposites. You're either pride or you're humble. Never met a, a proudful humble human being, <laughs> right? All right, so let me point out a couple of things about this first uh, beatitude. Uh, the Greek word for poor refers to absolute poverty. So think about this for just a moment. When we think of poor, what naturally comes to our mind is, okay, the person who is out here in the world that doesn't have a home, uh, doesn't have uh, food, doesn't have the basic necessities of life. Uh, when we read through the Gospels, we see those individuals uh, like blind Bartimaeus who are, are poor beggars. We, we liken them to the poor. And while that is true, it, it doesn't stop there. So Jesus evokes the image of a beggar someone who is hungry, destitute, infirm, who can't help themselves, who depends 
on the kindness of others to survive. So this pover poverty of spirit, it's the opposite of pride, but I want you to think about this. Without Jesus, you and I are poor, right? We're poor, we're lost, we're undone, we're helpless, we're hopeless. So keep that in mind as well. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, shows up us our helplessness before God, and we discover our absolute need for his help. Somebody once said, before you can be saved, you've got to understand, you know, why you're lost. The reason why you're lost. Uh, and before you can understand the good news of the gospel, you've got to understand the bad news. You can share the gospel with somebody and they'll say, well, why do I need that? Why do I need Jesus? Well, you go back to the fact that Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So you point out first and foremost that you're hopeless. The bad news is you're condemned to die not only physically but eternally because you've sinned against the holy righteous God. That's bad news. That's horrific news. As bad as the news is that we're seeing on the television today, that's even worse news. Because it's not just life that it affects, it's all eternity. That's bad news. But the good news, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you have the bad news, we're poor. But the good news is, if we humble ourselves, as Jesus humbled himself, then we can be made right with God. So, uh, anyways. All right, so the definition of humility, a complete absence of self. All right, under point number B, implications. We are incapable of spiritual good, so God must work in us. A couple of scriptures to write down that, that tie in with what I just mentioned. Uh, number one is Isaiah 64, 6. This will make you feel good. You ready? This is going to make you feel good. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags. Now, we're not talking about a rag like Richard uses at his shop, although some of those would be filthy rags because they'd have uh, some old motor oil or antifreeze or whatever it is on that. But we're talking about the filthy rags here. We're talking about rags that have been saturated in blood. Our, the, the very best of our good works is like those filthy rags. This is a part of the bad news. And then this is a good one as well. Uh, Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, not even one. Some translations render that there's none good, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. So we are incapable of spiritual good, so God must work in us. Uh, the Bible says it's the fool that is said in his heart, there is no God. The message of the cross is foolishness. Foolishness. Right? But to those, let me actually, I want to look that up right there. That's in 1 Corinthians. Let's make a note of that. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I think it's verse 17. Uh, verse 18, I'm sorry. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So God has to open our blinded eyes to the truth. So we're incapable of spiritual good in and of ourselves. Okay, number two, this heart attitude is a biblical self-concept, biblical self-concept. So humility should be the default attitude we have toward ourself. Uh, we fall short of the perfection of Christ. Um, people caught up in their own pride uh, are unable to see that. Again, it's God that opens blinded eyes to the truth. And, and it's not just 
Uh, think about that. It's not just eyes, but he's opening our heart to the truth of his word. So number two is the heart attitude is a biblical self, self concept, S-E-L-F dash concept. Number one, again, was God. So God must work in us. All right, that's under B, the implications. Let's look at the blessing under letter C. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Number one, we find salvation. We find salvation. When we go to God for help, he lifts us up out of our sin and our shame. He's the one that grants us entrance into his kingdom. It, it's his doing. Our spiritual poverty prepares us to receive his riches. A couple of things I wrote down under that point. Uh, I love these words. Number one is the word grace. If you want to write that out in your margin, I, that ties in well with what we're looking at here with salvation. Uh, grace is unmerited favor. It's uh, getting what I do not deserve. Heaven, I don't deserve heaven. I don't deserve a relationship with God. But because of his grace, um, the uh, acrostic for that, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. And the other one is mercy. Mercy is not getting what I deserve. What do I deserve? Eternity separated from God because of my sin. But God has shown me mercy and he's shown me grace. Praise God for that. So through God, uh, God, God provides us salvation, which comes through the person of Jesus. So we find salvation. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I've said this before, but let me point it out here again because it's worth noting. Uh, I think this is something we, we've just been taught over the years in church, uh, that when you trust Jesus, you're looking forward to one day going to heaven. Yes, we are, but we're not just looking forward to that. We're beginning to live eternal life right now in the present. And I always go back to John 10, to help me with that, Jesus said in John 10 that the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. That eternal life begins the moment you say yes to Jesus. So we're living for the purpose for which God created us until that time comes when we'll be with him for all eternity. All of that uh, is, is what this salvation encompasses. All right, number two, we recognize and enjoy Christ's rule, Christ's rule in our lives. Christ's rule in our lives. We submit our rights and our privileges to him. Uh, there used to be, let me point this out. And if you've got this on your, your car, I'm not gonna go look. You can take it off when you get home. <laughs> used to be a, a bumper, like a, a, a license plate on the front of the car that said, Jesus is my co-pilot. Co-pilot. I don't want Jesus to be, I don't want Jesus to be over here because if he's over here, you know what that means? I'm driving. I'm the co-pilot. Jesus is the pilot, right? Jesus is the one that's, that's in control. So I'm submitting all of me to all of him once for salvation but but day by day so i want jesus to rule in my life and and not myself so we're submitting to him the rights and the privileges that we have to serve him to use the gifts that we've been given to be good stewards of those gifts time talents and treasures for his glory. Uh, this kingdom is in fact a good kingdom. God is a good ruler. He makes his expectations clear. He offers his love absolutely. He forgives us when we ask. He gives us wisdom to use our talents, our gifts, and our strengths, and he supports us with his word. All right, any questions on Excuse me, the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, verse three. And again, this is, at, as much as we've covered in that, I'm sure you could probably spend at least twice that amount of time 
going even deeper. We're, we're, we're still, although we're going verse by verse, we're still just kind of scratching the surface. There's just so much that's contained in these. Okay, number two, under uh, Roman numeral number two, blessed are they that mourn, verse four. Under letter A there, the blank is sorrow, definition, sorrow over sin and its effects. So Christ offers a blessing to those who sorrow over sin, over their own sin, over the sin of others, over all the sin and corruption and destruction that we see. Uh, and, and we begin to really realize the devastation of sin. I, I think for too long in America, we've kind of just uh, swept sin under the rug. And I think we fail to realize that sin cannot be in the presence of God. And uh, I think that should cause us all the more of just when we sin. Y'all know what that's like. You've sinned before, and you're just how you feel after you sin. You're like, why did I do that? And just how you, it just makes you just like you just ate. 12 tacos or something from Taco Bell. You just like. So, so we should we should see sin the way that God sees it and, and sorrow over our sin and just sin in general. All right, here are the implications under letter B. Uh, page 22 in your workbook, if you want to turn over there to the next page. So we recognize sin as an offense against God. If the Spirit does indeed live in us, we will recognize sin for what it is, an abomination to God and to his creation, a perversion of his good work, a turn toward lies and darkness, betrayal of God's love for us. Sin is bad first and foremost because it runs counter to God's holiness and grace. It's the very opposite of what God desired for humanity. I mean, it goes back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God before sin. And that destroyed everything, their lives and our lives. And it, as, as easy as it would to be to summarize in just one word, the reason for what's happening in Ukraine right now is sin. I mean, it is. You've got a, a wild man it's all about ego and pride and what he can own. And that's his sin. I mean, that, it is what it is. All right, so recognizing it as an offense against God. All right, number two, we regret and condemn sin. I like what the author states here. We treat it like diseased garbage. Diseased garbage. We mourn what sin does in us, and we will mourn what sin does in other people. And again, uh, a good example for us to look to concerning this and the sorrow over sin is Jesus. Numerous times uh, in the Gospels, we see how he was uh, mourning as a result of sin. He had compassion for the people in Matthew chapter 9 because they were lost like sheep without a shepherd. And then in Luke 19, Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. He wept because he offered the people peace, but they rejected that. So Jesus wept and Jesus mourned. All right, number three, we repent from sin. That's simply a 180 degree turn. The military term is an about face. You're, and you've seen me do this. I've done this for years. You're walking in sin. You're following the ways of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus comes into your life. You do an about face, 180 degree turn, and you begin to passionately pursue Jesus. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be times that you turn back like this, but you're not going to continue to walk that way. It's not going to be a, a, a continual, habitual state that you're walking 180 degrees. We'll see in Jonah. We're in Jonah right now. We'll continue 
in Jonah this Sunday, but we'll see that Jonah, he's, uh, he's in the, the lower part of that boat. He, he, he recognizes God as being the creator, but he's not yet completely turned from that. Remember, he's still headed in the opposite direction, almost 3,000 miles away from where God's called him to go. So we repent of that. A uh, couple of verses that come to mind, you can write this down. You hear me quote these often as well. First John 1, 9, that's uh, specifically, I believe, for, for believers. Uh, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Uh, I guess it can be applied to unbelievers if they, when they repent and turn from their sin, but I like to apply that verse for believers. And then you hear me quote Romans 5, 8 often, uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we, we repent. All right, number four, we help others overtaken by sin. And don't think for a moment, this is where we need to pay close attention. Don't think for a moment that we can't get caught up in sin the way that another person is caught up in sin. We need to be mindful of that. Um, yeah, there's a lot that can be said about that, but there are others uh, that have been overtaken by sin. And, and, and I believe in cases like that, God wants to use us not to, to beat them down, but, but to lift them up, to, to bring them back. And the reality is you and I could be in the same situation. We're just one sin away. You know, so we need to be mindful of that, uh, that Christ is our, our hope. So we want to help those that have been taken by that. And it can be a number of different ways that that applies. It could be drugs, alcohol, uh, pornography. It could be all kinds of, all kinds of things. So uh, keep in mind as, as we think about that, that, that God's desire is uh, repentance and reconciliation. Re reconciliation. I think about the uh, uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, the parable of the, the son, of the prodigal, uh, prodigal son in Luke 15. All right, uh, letter C. Oh, man, looking at my clock. I don't know, y'all. Mm. We're going to try it. If you start getting sleepy, just raise your hand. Okay? <laughs> All right, letter C. I, I, I'll, I'll pick up the pace a bit. Uh, they will be comforted. They'll be comforted. <clears throat> this is the blessing. Uh, number one, they com uh, the comfort of salvation and assurance. Uh, God saves us. God seals us. Uh, that's, that's guaranteed. Uh, you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. Number two, the comfort of forgiveness and security. Uh, I pointed some of this out in a recent sermon that the sin that we ask God to forgive us of, we're the ones that typically go and pick that back up when God's forgiven us. He remembers it knows no more. He cast it as far as the east is from the west, which cannot be measured. He cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. So uh, his forgiveness, we need to be reminded of that and his security. Uh, number three, the comfort of eternity and glorification. Um, one day sin will no longer be. It, it'll, it'll be a, a nothing more than a memory. Uh, we'll be glorified with a new glorified body. No more sickness, no more suffering, pain, heartache, tears, none of that stuff. Uh, that's eternity and glorification. Okay, any questions on that? All right, let me, uh, let me at least go through number three and we'll see how we are on time. All right, the third beatitude, blessed are the meek, verse five. All right, letter A, the definition, recognizing our position, we submit ourselves to God. We're, uh, some of these are, are kind of overlapping to some degree, but we submit ourselves to God. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Again, it's total surrender. Uh, we're turning over the driver's seat to the Lord. We're giving him control of our lives, um, our, our, our beings. 
Um, we, we are now his, no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We're to glorify God with our body, which is not ours, but his. All to Jesus I surrender. Did y'all pick up on that part? All to Jesus I'll surrender. <laughs> I surrender. I surrender. All right, yeah. All right, here are the implications. Number one, we choose a better master, a better master. It's, it's neat how this kind of ties, some of this ties in with my sermon from Sunday. Uh, I said this, everybody serves something or someone. Everybody. You're serving something or someone. And that may be self. or maybe the Savior. But we choose a better master, and there's no better master than the master of the sea, Jesus Number two, we desire God's control and direction. We're seeking to walk down the straight and narrow path, not the one that is broad and leads to destruction. We want Jesus to be in control. We want to follow his direction. And how do we do that? Well, a part of that is what we're doing tonight, coming together uh, in, in uh, corporate worship, but individually we've got the sword right and your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path your word i've hidden in my heart that i might not sin against you it's it's the word that uh enables us to do that all right number three we do not fight i'm sorry we do not fight for our own sake it's not uh, about me. I'm, I'm a part of the family of God, but I'm uh, a, a soldier in the Lord's army. Um, it, it's not about my kingdom. It's about his kingdom. And here's one of the areas, and you as a church do a, a wonderful job with this. One of the temptations in a local church is to get consumed with the church being all about me. And the church being all about this church. And yes, this is a local autonomous church, but it's a lowercase c church versus the universal church worldwide. We, we partner with, and, and again, you do a re remarkable job of this, the cooperative program. Uh, we partner with other churches, with the Southern Baptist Convention to do things that we in and of ourselves just don't have all the resources to do, but, but we are working in cooperation with one another, not for our kingdom. Yes, we want to build the kingdom of God in pine level, but we want to, it to extend from pine level to, to Smithfield, to Selma, to Micro, to Princeton, to Tennessee, to, to the ends of the world. So it's not fighting for our own sake, but it's about his kingdom. Okay, uh, let us see the blessing. They will inherit the earth. They will inherit the earth. We remain content in the present. Content in the present. This kind of ties in with worrying, not worrying. Uh, we don't worry. We don't fret. Uh, we, uh, we give everything to God. And uh, when we do that, we give up the responsibility to, to worry and to fret about our lives. God's in control. Regardless of how out of control the world may seem, God is not sitting up in heaven going. He's in control. As crazy as the world seems to be out of control, we can, can rest in that. All right, number two, we find hope in our unmatched promise. Hope in our unmatched promise. Heaven will one day be our permanent home. One day we'll reign and rule with Jesus forever. All right, what y'all think? We got time to do it? Everybody good? How about everybody online? Are y'all good? Yep. All right. All right, let's roll on. We'll roll on to the next one. All right, here is the, uh, the fourth and final beatitude for tonight. 
Uh, blessed are they that hunger. Some of you are thinking about that right now. <laughs> you're like, 15 more minutes, I am hungry. <laughs> I'm hungering, but you're not hungering after. If you're hungering and thirsting for righteousness, you're going to be about diving into this. But if you're hungering and thirsting for the chicken leg, anyways, all right, let's go. All right, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Uh, letter A, the definition, a desire to be right with God and free from sin. Right with God and free from sin. So we will desire the righteousness of God. Um, we want to align ourselves with God's desires, with God's character, with God's work, with God's purpose. Uh, we're a member of uh, his kingdom. We're seeking to live that out on earth. Our desire is to be made right with God first and foremost, but to continue to live in a right relationship with God, obeying him. You can apply the example I used this past Sunday in when we, uh, we sin against God, it puts those roadblocks up. We have a relationship, but the fellowship is hindered, right? So we want to remain in a right relationship with God. And the way that we do that is to be free from sin. Somebody said something one time. I wish I would have uh, been the one given credit for saying this. But this, this is so true. This is worth even writing down. As a believer, you should keep short accounts of sin. As a believer, you should keep short accounts of sin. What do I mean by that? That when you sin, that you confess that to the Lord. Keep short accounts of it. Because what happens if you don't is you, you sin with this sin, you sin with that sin, you sin with this and, 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 and the fellowship is hindered. But when you're keeping short accounts of sin, and 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a verse that I rely on a lot. I'm going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I thought for the longest time that as long as I didn't act on the sin, it wasn't a sin. But if I've allowed that sin to come right here and right here and I meditate on that and dwell on that, that's sin. And if I don't do something with that, I can either feed that or I can confess that. So it, it, it matters. Even our, even our thoughts. It took me the longest time to understand that. Even our thoughts matter. If you sit around eight hours a day and think on things that are impure, unholy, and unrighteous, that's not good. So we need to be mindful of that. So desire our right... Uh, to be right with God and free from sin. All right, the implications on page 23. I'll scoot right through these. Number one, we need the righteousness of God. Uh, we talked about that. I won't uh, elaborate on that. Uh, again, it's Christ's righteousness, imputed righteousness. Uh, letter A, hunger and thirst are intense. This desire may at times be severe. Christians that stray from the Father will realize over time uh, as the spirit works, that something is missing in their lives. But if you're keeping those short account of sins, confessing those. All right, B, hunger and thirst reoccur. Man, it, wouldn't it be wonderful like to drink this cup of coffee and just like be, not want another cup? But I've already had a cup today, right? So um, we're to hung, hunger and thirst reoccur. So we need to be mindful of that. All right, number two, we reject happiness as a goal. Let me repeat that. We reject happiness as a goal. It's not that it's not okay to be happy, but more than anything, we want joy. And joy comes from the Lord. There's a difference between joy and happiness. I'm not going to, y'all heard me say that time and time again. With my red Corvette example. There's a, a difference between that. So we reject happiness as the goal. The goal is joy. Jesus, others, and yourself. There's another acrostic. J-O-Y, Jesus, others, yourself. Okay. The blessing, C. They will be filled. They will be filled. We want what God's want, what God wants. And when we have that, we will not be disappointed. All right, number one, God satisfies those who seek him. So the Bible say, 
search for me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. We need to search for the Lord. We need to seek him day in and day out. Number two, God is the one who accomplishes this good work. Uh, again, it's the spirit working in and through us that allows us to accomplish it. So God's the one that gets the credit for it. All right, with the broader Christian doctrine, we should apply these, uh, this image in at least three different ways. Let me point these out and we'll conclude. Letter A, at the point of salvation, God fills us with positional righteousness. Positional righteousness. So what that means is when we trusted Christ as Savior, he changed our standing before God. We're no longer at enmity with God, enemies with God. We're now a child of God. So, so that's a done deal. The moment you turn from your sins, repented and trusted Jesus, that's positional righteousness. You have a right standing with God now. B, today God continues to sanctify us through Christ's righteousness. You've heard me point this out before in other studies. Theologically, the word is sanctification. There's justification, sanctification, and glorification. You're justified. You're made right with God because of what Jesus did. You turn from your sins. You're, you trusted Jesus with your life. You have a right standing with God now. You're sanctified. You're being sanctified. Um, Richard and I pointed this out on a number of occasions. John 3.30. I know that's a verse that Richard uses. He must increase, I must decrease. That's a part of the sanctification process day in and day out. And then glorification that we talked about just a few moments ago. So God continues to sanctify us. He's still working on it. All right, and then let her see. One day God will glorify us in perfect righteousness. And the glorification that takes place when Jesus returns or when you die and go to be with the Lord, then you will transition from sanctification to glorification. It will be uh, a perfect reflection of Christ's righteousness.